scientists and um, birders, etc. They all use this um, site as a world to track bird numbers worldwide. So if you're talking about Lake County Forest Preserve, um, we are considered, you know, pretty high quality with a lot of species. So we see 351 species of birds in our preserves and 11 are, are sites with almost 200 different bird species. Um, that's pretty impressive numbers. Um, so a lot of these are called important bird areas and they host resident birds like we talked about, birds that will nest in Lake County and they also host um, migrants as they're passing through. So some of the hotspots are gonna be focused around those different habitats that I mentioned at the beginning. So those hotspots are gonna include the shore of Lake Michigan. All the things in green are um, Lake County Forest Preserves. Um, uh, wetlands, the Des Plaines River Corridor, which you can kind of see the orange line running through the middle here. That's the Des Plaines River Trail, and you can see all the green around it. So that's, that unfragmented habitat is really important. Um, and unfragmented woods, especially in the southern part of Lake County, Ryerson and Dan and Wright Woods are um, usually pretty big hotspots. So we've got the lakefront sites and Lake Michigan is a huge spot. Um, Illinois Beach State Park, both north and south parts, uh, Waukegan Beach, North Point Marina, um, and Fort Sheridan Forest Preserve. That's a pretty great place um, in particular right now. Um, during fall hawk migration. That's a big thing that's happening right now. Um, we actually have some volunteers out there called Hawk Watch and they monitor um, migrating hawks and that's a good place to see them. Uh, Chain of Lake State Park way out in the northwestern part of the county um, and Spring Bluff up in the northern part. Rollins Savannah is considered an important bird area by the Audubon, so that um, has a ton of different species. Always good, always good birding there. Same with Middle Fork Savannah as well in Lake Forest. And Ryerson Woods is um, a super high quality, 550 plus acre site in the southern part of the county, which really hosts a lot of some of the um, woodland species that we'll talk about tonight. And Independence Grove is uh, large in the center of the county, um, big, huge, used to be a gravel quarry, and now is, um, is a recreation and forest preserve area that hosts a lot of good early spring uh, waterfowl migrants. So we'll, um, we're gonna go through uh, the different seasons of the year and kind of talk about who you might see and at which season. And there's a lot of birds on this um, slideshow. I'm not gonna talk about each individual one, um, but just so you know, there are a lot here and we'll, we'll touch on some kind of things about each one. So we're gonna start in early spring, which is March and April. And the types of birds that you might see at this time are um, waterfowl, and that means ducks, geese, um, large aquatic birds um, and a lot of those coming through in the early spring you're not going to see nest here they're, they're on their way to Canada <laughs> or Lake Superior um, shorebirds which are any birds seen along the shore that <laughs> and passerines and passerines are perching birds so those are they have feet that are um, designed for perching on branches and these are really our songbirds that you probably pretty familiar with like robins and such so early spring, and we're talking March at this point, is, is a really great time to see those fall, um, or those, um, sorry, uh, waterfowl that are migrating, and they're, they're just stopping by for the most part. A lot of these guys are just stopping by. And that guy is called the Northern Shoveler there. He's got a really huge um, bill, uh, and he's, he uses that great bill um, with comb-like projections to kind of, filter out tiny crustaceans and seeds and things from the water. So we're gonna talk, when we talk about waterfowl and ducks primarily, we're really talking about um, dabblers and divers. So this first group here on this slide, these are divers and these are ducks that are gonna dive down deep to get their food. Um, and so that's, you know, they're usually in, seen in big waters like the Great Lakes, Lake Michigan. And these, a lot of these guys are gonna be heading 
um, further north and they're just going to be stopping by. Um, so a lot of these nests further north, for instance, this guy in the bottom left, that's a common merganser. I was actually just telling Nina that I was up in the UP of Michigan this past weekend. Um, uh, our fam my husband's family has a cottage up there uh, right on Lake Superior and we saw these guys up there. So they, they're on their way back down, so we might see them through, but they come through in the spring as well. Um, and then something like a, a common loon up here in the right corner. These are all ducks that are gonna dive deep, um, getting fish or plants, like tubers of plants or seeds or crustaceans or insects and things like that, our big water diving ducks. Um, and then we have our dabbler ducks. So these are usually seen in smaller waters. So wetlands, small ponds, streams, even flooded fields. And you'll hear birders talk about floodles. And those are fields, usually agricultural fields, that have flooded and still have some puddles and water there. And they usually attract some different interesting birds on occasion. So you will recognize, you know, our mallard duck here as, um, <clears throat> as a dabbler duck. And that means that they're going to tip into the water and tip their bottoms up and kind of go around and just dabble for, for different foods. So they're looking for things like um, insects and plants usually, and they're just gonna dabble around. So our mallard does nest here in Lake County. So does this one in the top right, that's a blue winged teal. That's another Lake County nester, pretty small duck. Um, they're kind of known, they have this crescent shaped kind of, moon by their uh, face. That's a really good way to find that. And then these beautiful guys, um, the wood duck. And these ones are really interesting. Um, they nest in kind of um, near rivers and water in holes in trees. So if a woodpecker were to make a hole in a tree, um, these are ducks that'll use that or where a branch has fallen out and they'll nest in the holes in the tree. Um, so you might see wood duck boxes up and those get put up to help encourage that nesting. But they're kind of a skittish duck, and they're usually seen in like wooded areas. So down at Ryerson Woods or Dan and Wright Woods near the Des Plaines River in those wet, flood, flooded um, woodlands. So here are some good places where you would see these different waterfowl in March and April. So Spring Bluff Forest Preserve up north, um, Fort Sheridan along the lake, uh, Almond Marsh is a good place um, to see them, Chain of Lakes, Independence Grove. Um, Independence Grove in particular is really good, I think, for a lot of those diving ducks because the lake is pretty large. I've seen, you know, in March and April, loons and a lot of those northern species. <clears throat> so some other things that you're going to see in early spring are shorebirds. So these are birds seen you know, along different shorelines. Um, and some of these do stick around and nest here. And one in particular, or two in particular that you might recognize, um, this one at the bottom right, that's a killdeer. And those guys are um, pretty prevalent kind of all over. Uh, they, um, th you can see those like in parking lots on the sides. They usually nest kind of in open areas, even like ball fields and things like that. And they do this kind of kill deer call. I hear one every morning at my house. Um, and they also do this little act. They have this broken wing act that they do. Um, if they uh, feel like they want to protect their nest, the mother bird will fake like she has a broken wing to attract a predator far away from her nest. They're not super picky. Um, about things like that. And then this bird on the top left. This is another kind of favorite early spring one to look for. And this is called a, um, American Woodcock. And these are pretty, pretty awesome birds to watch. They have a very interesting spring courtship um, uh, flight and ritual. So they will, um, the males, they'll find a place that's kind of on the edge of a forest in a field, even though they do spend time probing in the mud with these long beaks, the tip is kind of flexible and they will use it to um, kind of feel around for worms and other things in the soil. But they will kind of hang out at the edge of a field and the males will fly up in the air and make kind of a whirling sound um, with their wings and that attracts the females. And then they'll be on the ground painting 
um, making a sound, it kind of sounds like meh, meh, and that'll attract the females. And they, they actually nest right on the ground. So that's why they have really great camouflage. So that's when we do, you know, when we're back doing programming with people, hopefully, hopefully next spring, um, we do often do woodcock walks at night where we take people out to show them this, this kind of fun spring ritual that goes on with that bird. So those shorebirds that you would, good places to look for those would be down here in Lake Zurich, Cuba Marsh, um, Heron Creek, Ryerson Woods. Ryerson Woods always has a couple of populations and same with um, Heron Creek and Cuba uh, of those woodcocks that, that I mentioned, the interesting spring flight. And it happens right about at dusk. So it's pretty, it's pretty fun to watch. So some of the other birds that you'll see in early spring, like that March, April time, are these small, per these perching birds. Um, so we've got a little winter wren here and a song sparrow and I bet everybody recognizes this guy, the red winged blackbird. And he's kind of the quintessential, like when we see him, everyone in our office, um, the other educators and naturalists I work with were like, okay, spring is here because red winged blackbirds are back. And, um, you know, I think everybody has a story about red winged back blackbirds. Um, they are pretty territorial uh, around there. Uh, nesting sites and their territories. So everyone, you know, I have an area where I like to run and I know I've learned over the years not to run in this one area in, you know, April because <laughs> um, they do, they will kind of dive down to scare you away from their sites. They, they don't really generally um, cause any harm, but they are pretty um, protective of their nesting sites. They are the most, um, <clears throat> abundant bird in North America. So we, you can kind of see them uh, everywhere. And then this cutie down on the bottom right, that's a Eastern bluebird. And those, um, they're thrushes, so they're in the same family as robins. And they nest in tree cavities or holes in trees as well. Over time, historically, they had a little bit trouble um, because they would get kind of kicked out by non-native birds or other aggressive birds. Um, but in the last 50 years or so, there's been a big push to have um, bluebird boxes put up to help them and bluebird monitoring uh, networks all across the country. And um, they've actually seen a huge population increase. And in fact, at the Lake County Forest Preserves, we have over 500 bluebird boxes and we have a whole volunteer segment dedicated to monitoring the bluebird boxes and maintaining them and counting the birds and how many fledge. Um, and so this is kind of a good gem to see. Usually I see that in March when I'm making maple syrup at Ryerson Woods, they start to come around. So really that lower, um, that southern part of the county, the Upper Des Plaines River corridor. So these kind of section, this section is really good for seeing those um, perching birds in spring. Some other kind of specialties you might see in spring are um, over on the left you have, that's a yellow-bellied sapsucker. And that's the one woodpecker species that is actually considered migratory. Um, the other woodpecker species that we see here, and there'll be a slide later of those, are all um, either kind of locally migrant or you see them year round in places. But this yellow-bellied sapsucker um, drills little holes into the um, little sap wells where they lap up the sap and they also catch any insects and things, spiders and things that um, collect in there. And you really only see them, I'd say April is a good time to see those guys in the woodland areas. And then they're gone. I remember a couple of years ago, I was doing a woodpecker program and we managed to see, it was in April, it was around Earth Day. And we did manage to see every species of woodpecker um, I think except the pileated. So th that's a good time to go look for them. And then here's the turkey vulture. Um, these guys are kind of known as um, kind of riding thermals, the hot air that columns of air that rise. Um, they're kind of known for this V shape. These are uh, decomposers or, um, you know, they go, they are known to have really strong sense of smell. Um, not a lot of birds do, some shorebirds do, and some research is showing that more birds can smell a little bit better, but in general, birds are kind of known to not have great senses of smell, except this guy can sniff out fresh dead meat, and that's what he's looking for. And then, then in your top 
uh, right side, that's a sandhill crane that I mentioned at the beginning. And that's a bird that 20 years ago when I started working at the Forest Preserve was kind of um, in uh, threatened, I believe, um, at the time. And due to habitat restoration in areas that they prefer, um, their number and population has increased dramatically. Um, they really need large spaces, so big field next to a big wetland, um, and they don't like being bugged by people. Um, they make their nests in the wetland typically, sometimes on land, but usually it's a, about five feet in diameter, and it's a big kind of nest in the water. And think of it as like a castle with a moat around it. So that's a pretty special bird. There are crane counts every year to kind of keep track of that bird. Um, and we do have some sites where you can pretty regularly see that one. And then down here in the bottom right is the American white pelican. <clears throat> and these guys are really a treat to see. They're like the big, one of the biggest birds in North America. They don't stick around here. They're gonna go way further north. But in early spring and April, you can see them on bigger bodies of water. I know last spring, um, Eileen Davis and I, who she's done some programs for you guys before, uh, we saw a big flock of these guys at Hastings Lake, and that was pretty, pretty fun to see. So that's a real special thing if you see those guys. And so you're gonna see these specialties in, you know, that that area of the Ryerson Half Day Right Woods. Um, oops, let me go back to that. Also, you know, Hastings Lake um, up here, kind of Lindenhurst area. Um, Lake Villa area, like where you are, um, that's a great area to check out for the, some of these things as well. And then the sandhill cranes, I'd say if you really want to see sandhill cranes, go to Rollins Savannah or even um, Lakewood Forest Preserve. Some of it's going to be under construction soon, um, but that I always see them in the agricultural field, just um, just south of. Um, uh, in the southern part of the preserve. I kind of see them every time. So they must be nesting near there too as well. And then you get to May. And May is the month for warblers. <laughs> May is like the beginning, is the, the big um, migration push. So a lot of the birds that you're gonna see in May are tiny and very colorful. Um, and they are the neotropical migrants. So these are birds that are coming from South and Central and America. And some of these birds are gonna go from Southern South America all the way to Northern parts of Canada. So these little teeny jewels are gonna be making this huge flight. Um, they fly at night, these guys. And so they use different kind of things to help them navigate. They use um, magnetic forces of the earth. They use the stars. They also use um, the waterways, so rivers or the shoreline of Lake Michigan uh, as migration maps. So these guys are you know, on the move at night, so the best time to really see them is when they stop to take a break. <laughs> and that's in the early morning, so sunrise, through the first few hours of the day, they are exhausted, they've been flying all night, they drop down into natural areas, and that's where these habitats are super important because they need places to rest and feed and refuel before they take off. And so they're pretty active because they're feeding, um, and they're really kind of special birds. Um, so here's a lot of them, and these are all our woodland warblers. Um, they're like little jewels. I just love these guys. These are my, um, they say, you know, birders, people who b like to get into the hobby of birding. Um, there's a spark bird, so a bird that kind of sparks them into um, really getting into it. And I would say this guy down at the bottom here was one bird for me years and years ago. And this is a black burning warbler. And these guys aren't going to stick around. They're going to go way north. Um, but all these little birds, um, these little neotropical migrants, they are gonna be using these teeny little beaks to kind of glean or grab the tiny insects that are pollinating the tree flowers. So if you think about the big oak trees or the big maple trees that we have around, they all flower around May. And those teeny flowers that we sometimes don't pay that much attention to, um, 
they, they need to get pollinated and it's little gnats and wasps and all sorts of things. And these are, that's what these guys are feeding on. Um, a lot of these are specialists of the canopy of the forest, this guy in particular. Um, some do stick around and nest here in Lake County. So this one on the top center is um, a common yellowthroat warbler with that little black mask. And they like to kind of, they do nest in Lake County. And I see them come through my yard. Um, they they kind of like to, they have some skulking behavior. So these are a little bit down low. So if you're, you know, new to birding or you want to really see these brightly colored birds. This one's usually a pretty easy one to find. They hang out low in thickets and they kind of skulk around. Um, they have a call that says witchity, 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 witch. Um, so they, they do, they're pretty noisy. So that's another way to find them. And then this guy here in the far right center, that's a yellow warbler with the little streaks of kind of rusty red. And they do nest here as well. And they sing sweet, 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 oh so sweet. And um, they like to nest in hawthorns and things like that. So these are birds you could even see nesting in your yard if you had some great native plants, um, you know, or, or shrubs or things like that. Um, some of the other passerines, and all these guys also nest here in Lake County, can be seen in woodlands, um, the grassland birds, and savannas. These are... Um, Mostly, well, they can be seen in a variety of those places. One in particular that's fun to watch is down on the bottom left is a ruby-throated hummingbird. And that's really our only species of hummingbird that comes through um, east of the Mississippi. So, um, and these guys, these little dynamos, they will migrate through. You'll start seeing them around in May. Um, that's a good time to put those hummingbird feeders up. And then they, they get, they're really active, and then they nest over the summer. And then come late August, they're on the move again. And they've doubled because they now have babies going with them. And they'll fly um, to Mexico and they will actually fly over the Gulf of Mexico in one swoop. So they're, you know, pretty impressive. They drink sip nectar um, or sugar water from your feeders. Um, Orioles are another fun one you can attract um, to your yard by using kind of orange slices or they sometimes even come to my hummingbird feeder or grape jelly of all things. So, <laughs> um, but these are all, uh, you know, kind of really interesting birds. This is an indigo bunting, a scarlet tanager, rose-breasted grosbeak. These are all going to nest here in Lake County and they're, you know, every color of the rainbow you got there. So good places to see any of these birds um, is again, uh, Ryerson Woods, Daniel Wright Woods. That's a really good place to go in May. Any day in May, go there. And Illinois Beach State Park, a couple of years ago, we took some volunteers up birding there, and I think we had 20 some species of warblers in one day. Um, so if you get a big fallout, meaning, you know, if there's a big southern wind in the spring that pushes all the birds up this Lake Michigan shoreline, you can see they're following this, they're following this, and then the winds shift and it gets cold coming from the north. These birds stick around for a few days up here. So Illinois Beach can sometimes be a really uh, great place to kind of see that happen. And then you get to summer and some of those birds that we just talked about, the warblers and all those birds that are on the move, um, if they're gonna move further north and nest, then they're out of here by June usually. And if they're not, if they're gonna stay in Lake County and nest, then typically, um, they, they aren't um, as visible because they've quieted down. They're not calling and singing to each other as much because they've already attracted their mate and they've established their territory, right? And now they're, they're you know, laying eggs and guarding the nest and they've quieted down a bit. So, but what you will see are um, rails and herons and some other perching birds, um, you know, that Oriole does, they, they're pretty, still pretty active. Um, so rails, herons, and egrets you start to see in more abundance. They're kind of out. You get this little green heron kind of hanging out, you know, hiding on the side of, you know, the Des Plaines River or the side of a wetland, kind of scrunched down. Um, great blue herons. I think everyone's probably seen this one in the sky um, in the bottom right on your screen. Um, big kind of prehistoric bird. They've got this long beak, really good for getting in there and getting fish, frogs, things like that. <clears throat> and 
And there is a still, I think, um, a heron rookery. Um, they live, they actually make, build nests in the tops of uh, dead trees that are in wetlands, so snags. And there's rookeries all throughout Lake County. Um, I believe there's still one at uh, <coughs> uh, Almond Marsh currently. And then egrets. And one thing, you know, we mentioned the sandhill crane before. Um, and sometimes people get cranes and herons kind of confused with one another. But one way, a quick way to know if you're looking at a heron or a crane flying is that the crane will fly with its neck straight out and the heron will fly with its neck kind of um, in an S shape. So that's kind of a quick like glance if you look up uh, that you can, you can make that note. So these guys are gonna be congregating around water. Um, you know, Chain of Lakes is really great to see any of these. Really any, whoops, anywhere that we have water, you're gonna see these guys. Um, so any, any big wetland will work. Um, and these savannas too, like Rollins Savanna has big wetlands in the middle of it. Same with Middle Fork. So those are always good to see. So some of the, um, Perching birds that you'll see during the summer months that are a little bit more, a little easier to see, a lot of those grassland specialists. And grassland is an important area that um, there are certain birds that really need those grasslands. In particular, um, at Ray Lake Forest Preserve, I know I regularly see this guy in the bottom right, that's called a bobolink. And that's um, kind of a rare bird, uh, but you can see it with regularity in some of our preserves. But that's a, one of those indicator species. So remember we talked about birds that tell you that it's a you know, high quality site. So Rollins Savanna is one here. Um, the meadowlark, Eastern meadowlark is kind of a bird of summer. Um, they are out and prevalent in those, those types of area. I was just up in the summer at um, Ethel's Woods and saw a bunch of these guys. Um, tree swallows. I think they're everywhere. <laughs> I see these guys everywhere. They they like to um, zip over. They're kind of have the V-shaped uh, tail and they just kind of zip over any fields catching insects on the wing. So they're flying over and getting insects as they're flying through. And there are a number of different swallows that we see here in the summer. Tree swallows um, and then cl uh, cliff swallows are another one. Um, Barn swallow, or yeah, barn swallows as well. Um, we have a number of species. Barn swallows are the ones that make kind of muddy nests. Like I always see them um, if I'm paddling at Independence Grove, they like to go on the bridges or paddling along the Des Plaines River Trail. They'll be making their muddy nests kind of under the bridges. And then this guy in the top left is a red bellied woodpecker. So that's one of our resident woodpeckers. And, and you can pretty much see all of the woodpeckers in the summer months. Um, that we have here. And then this one in the bottom left is a wood thrush. And that's, that bird is kind of known to have one of the sweetest songs um, of all birds. I, I don't see it a lot. Um, I hear it in May usually, and then it quiets down. It's, it's uh, also a thrush, so related to a robin and a bluebird. They're all in the same family. So that you see them low usually on the ground in a high quality woodland. So some of the places you'd see these again is that lower um, or southern part of the Des Plaines River Trail. Um, Middle Fork Savanna is really good for those grassland birds, Rollins Savanna too. Illinois Beach is good for everything. <laughs> and same with Chain of Lakes State Park. And then you get to fall and the, you know, the season that we're in now and you might start to see some of those same birds that flew north uh, to nest uh, in the spring you're going to see them come back through in the fall. All of those birds are going to come back through. Um, so those shorebirds again. But what really happens a lot that you see is the raptor migration. Um, they are big kind of groups of raptors that come through and they're using the warm thermals and they're migrating through and places to see those all sorts of different hawks and owls and different things that you can see um, through. And Fort Sheridan is really the place to see that. Somewhere where there's big open sky and along the lakefront. And Fort Sheridan seems to be a place that's been kind of earmarked as that. So some of the shorebirds that we um, 
you know, talked about before, like this killdeer here that has nested here, it's going to head, um, you'll see all sorts of different varieties of shorebirds. Um, this is a yellow legs, you see different sandpipers, plovers, um, anywhere along the lakefront or, or um, so Illinois Beach State Park is great for those. Waukegan Beach um, is fantastic. And Rollins, again, is that important bird area. So they kind of get everybody um, you'll see through come through. And then some of the raptors that we'll see coming through, um, <clears throat> peregrine falcons actually do nest here in the area. Um, they don't really make a nest, they kind of just make a scrape on an edge of a cliff and, and really they've been kind of concentrated in some of our more urban areas around here. They were reintroduced I believe in like 1980, don't quote me on the exact year, but there was a, re a peregrine falcon reintroduction project um, in the city of Chicago and surrounding areas and they utilize the skyscrapers as their um, <clears throat> nesting spots and they hang out in those urban areas. I know there's one at the top of the downtown Evanston library, um, but you know, they can nest in natural areas as well, but they've kind of become, uh, you know, synonymous with those kind of skyscrapers and areas. I was actually at the um, John Hancock building years and years ago, um, and my husband and I, we saw one of them kind of dive, you know, we were having dinner on the 95th floor and it was pretty amazing. So they're a cool bird to see. Um, the most common hawk, if you look up in the sky and you see a hawk, um, most commonly it's going to be this one in the lower right, the red-tailed hawk. That's your, um, you know, 90% of the time. They nest here, um, you know, you're, you're gonna see it, this kind of rusty red tail. The females in general of raptors are quite a bit larger than the males. Um, so that's another thing to kind of look for. Um, but this is kind of a fun time to see all these soaring hawks if you get a clear day, especially over by the lakefront. So yeah, um, there are hawk watch programs. These are volunteers that go out and sit and hang out and look for hawks and, and any other birds that come by. And they report all their findings on eBird that we mentioned um, at the beginning of the program. They have a group at Illinois Beach State Park and then also one at Fort Sheridan uh, State or Forest Preserve as well. And then winter, sadly, or I don't know how you feel about it, <laughs> is upon us, right? And um, but there's still some interesting things to see uh, in winter. Uh, bird wise. Um, so it's not a time to put your binoculars away. It's a time to kind of go out and search for some of these rare things or interesting things that you might be able to find. So there are some some cool waterfowl to look for before things start to freeze over. Um, and owls kind of become, you know, the raptors are the king of the fall because we see a ton of them in migration. And then I always think of the owls as being kind of the quintessential winter bird. Um, Owls in our area start calling in the winter because they're establishing territory. Because believe it or not, um, one of our species of owls will start nesting in January. And then woodpeckers. We do have um, a number of low, uh, resident woodpeckers. And like I mentioned before, um, those ones, woodpeckers in general aren't really migratory, except for one species, the yellow-bellied sapsucker. But we do have a number of species that are here year round, um, or maybe it's not the exact same bird you're seeing, but it's one from not as, you know, a short distance away, maybe a more regional shift and other um, perching birds. So you might see something like the canvas back duck or a mergansers here. This is the diving duck. They have kind of, remember that, that um, skinny beak diving down. Uh, to get fish. You might see these guys in the winter in bigger lakes, um, like at um, up at Spring Bluff, North Point Marina, or Independence Grove. If, if you're going to go somewhere in the winter and early spring to look for waterfowl, I would just say go to Independence Grove. Um, 
Pre-COVID, we were doing something called birding hotspots where we would be kind of set up in a spot that we know is going to be really good to see specific birds at specific months or times of the year. And hopefully we'll be able to resume that once we resume in-person programming. But I know usually in March and in the winter, we're at Independence Grove for that. Hey, Jane, and we then, have a question. We have oh, a question. sure. Yeah, go ahead. Do turkey vultures eat things other than fresh dead meat? Not really, not to my knowledge. Um, and they won't really eat, from my understanding, things that have been dead for a long time. <laughs> so they generally are looking for something that's been freshly, um, freshly dead. Um, they do nest in this area and they're not super picky nesters either. They'll, um, they'll use an old hawk nest or they'll use like a mammal burrow. They'll nest on the ground. Um, they kind of aren't too picky and they aren't that picky really about their food as long as it's freshly, freshly dead. I read some research one, one time that said they took, you know, or I think it was a rabbit that was freshly killed and one that was had left for a few days and they would almost never go to the one that had been left. So, you know, I guess they're picky in that way. <laughs> um, we have another question. Sure. Um, it seems as though sandhill cranes are staying around later in the fall. Are any staying through winter? So generally sandhill cranes will not stay through the winter. They, you know, they don't really, start to have a big migration push till later in the fall. Um, there's a place in Indiana called Jasper Pulaski Wildlife Area. It's kind of near Valparaiso. And that's a big stopping ground for cranes that are migrating through. And that's usually like mid-November. You'll see big groups of cranes there. Um, so they might stick around if, you know, they're finding food, um, you know, they're finding open water and things. So maybe if it's milder, they'll stick around a little longer, but they will generally um, shove out of the area. Now, um, great blue herons and egrets, they might stay for the winter if there's open water. And I have seen that in some years. So um, it's not out of the question, but cranes generally will get out of here and they go down to Florida, the ones that we have nesting here, um, and they'll hang out in Florida, uh, you know, where there's more food, <laughs> um, but more competition. So then they eventually come back north to nest. Um, but cranes generally will migrate, but herons and egrets, um, if there's open water, they'll stick around quite a, quite a time. That's a good question. Any others? No. Uh -uh. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so... Winter is the time for owls. Um, and you know, I mentioned having a spark bird of that little Blackburnian warbler. Um, this guy in the bottom left is my other spark bird. I was running at night <clears throat> along the Lake Michigan shoreline with a couple of friends. I was just out of college and we saw this guy perched on the top of a, a a flagpole, <laughs> like the rounded thing. And I just stood there. Um, I was actually with my sister and a couple of friends. And she claims that I, I left her in the dust because I wanted to go back and look at the snowy owl. So th these are not going to um, nest here, but this is a northern species of, of owl. They live in the tundra, but their kind of population and their numbers are based on the boom and bust cycle of their prey in the tundra, which are lemmings, which are a rodent. Um, and so when the snowy owl populations grow immensely in a boom period, the younger owls, the juvenile birds, will actually get kind of pushed further and further south. Um, and so what ends up happening is we do see them in what we call eruption years. Um, so you'll see groups of snowy owls in the winter here in Lake County. Um, best places to see them are places that mimic the tundra. So treeless areas, uh, the lakefront and um, agricultural fields um, are often the two places you see them. And you will see them out during the daytime. Um, so it is pretty fun to go and see them. They're, they're pretty awesome to watch. Um, and they'll be out in the daytime because in the Arctic, they're out, you know, in the summer when it's 
24 hour suns. So they're not used to, you know, the, that situation here as much. Um, I will say that that's a bird that draws a lot of attention. And this is just kind of a general for any of these birds. And, you know, you want to make sure that even though it's really amazing and fascinating to see these animals, we want to make sure to always respect their space um, and not get too close to get a good picture or to view them. And I say that because a lot of times this snowy owl does draw a big crowd and people trying to get really close. Um, so just a little bit word to the wise to be mindful of that anytime you're looking uh, at birds. This one on the top left is a great horned owl and that's the that's the owl that nests first in our area and it's really the bird that is the first nester in our area from my knowledge and they will nest you know start kind of laying eggs and sitting on them and incubating their eggs in late January. Um, so you know We'll hear a lot of owls calling in the winter because they are starting to establish um, territory. Uh, this guy in the bottom right is the, these are the eastern screech owls. They also nest here in Lake County. Um, these two others are short-eared and long-eared owls, and they do not nest here, but they can be seen kind of in different times, um, casually coming into the area. Uh, at places like Rollins, Savannah, um, oh, I do, I do have a slide. Rollins, Lions Woods, there's some, um, an old, like, planted evergreen forest up there, and so that kind of mimics the, you know, natural landscape for that short ear and long ear doll, so you can sometimes see them there as well. Um, just going back to the great horned owl, this guy's kind of fascinating. Remember, we kind of touched on the turkey vulture having a strong sense of smell, well, the opposite is true for owls, and um, in particular, the great horned owl will is kind of a prime predator for skunks because they don't really smell that well, so they don't really care if they get sprayed, and um, they're a, pr a predator that's big enough to eat something as large as a skunk, um, and so that's just kind of an interesting note that, that they will eat skunk, so um, we like to have them around. We got a couple questions, Jen. Sure, let me go back to the owl slide. I bet it's about owls. <laughs> no, it's not actually. Oh, okay. okay, the first one is, we seem to see herons by themselves and sandhill cranes in pairs. Are herons more individual birds and cranes prefer to be in a pair? So a lot of times when you're seeing sandhill cranes here, it's um, because they're nesting. So they, they do pair up and they have um, some interesting courtship rituals. Um, in the spring, they will do a dance and they will even like paint with mud on their feathers and all this stuff. And then after that, once they've had their chicks, they usually have, um, they usually lay two to three eggs and usually have one to two babies survive. Those chicks or colts will stick with them um, until the migration season. So oftentimes what you might be seeing is uh, a, a parent set and their colt, you know, from that year. And then the herons, you know, they're not as tied to each other. They're not kind of feeding together as much. I mean, if you go to say a heron rookery, you're gonna see a lot of activity. It's all kind of like seemingly communal. They're, they're just congregating in the same areas. So you will see big groups of them together, but after they've nested, you know, um, generally you will see the cranes kind of together more as a family unit. That's a good one. Okay, then the next question is, mm -hmm. when was Pine Dunes Preserves developed? We visited there yesterday for the first time. It's beautiful. We it saw is beautiful. Lots of coots, coots. Yeah, okay, yeah. Okay. Coots are a waterfowl with like a little short stubby beak. Um, so Pine Dunes, I have to look it up, but it's been in the recent last three years, I think. Um, it's part of this um, whole kind of, uh, suite of preserves up in that northern part is the Dutch Gap properties, I think it was the original name of all of them, but um, it's been in the last couple of years and it is a real gem. Uh, we were just talking about it today at a staff meeting about it being such a high quality preserve. So it's up in that kind of northern part of the county. Um, and yeah, I would strongly encourage anyone to go there. Um, it's a good, it's a nice place to go in the winter too. It has a lot of beautiful views. Um, 
So I would, I would say it's been in the last handful of years. I, I'm not certain of the exact year, but it's not been too long because I remember going out there maybe two winters ago with staff for, you know, we try to go visit the newer preserves to kind of look at them, see what, what we could share about them. And that's always, uh, that's always one everyone wants to go to. Okay. Yeah, that's it for now. Okay, great. So we, we talked about owls, let's see, and uh, talked about that one. Oh, woodpeckers. So these are good ones. You know, woodpeckers. You muted yourself, Jen. You muted yourself. Jen. Jen. Hey, Jen, maybe it's my computer. Is it my computer? Jen, 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 we can't hear you. We can't hear you, Jen. I'm unmuted. There you go. There you, you were better? gone for a little while. You were gone for a while. I can't hear you. You can't hear me? No, someone someone said, um, he said Eek. it's not you, we cannot hear her. So something's wrong. Hold on, I'm gonna stop sharing for a second. I can't hear you either. Um, can anybody put in chat whether or not they can hear me? It's Nina. Can you hear me? Someone? <laughs> okay, let's see. Okay, now they can hear us. They, um, Jen, okay. <laughs> okay, so it's okay, but you just- It's okay, hear keep going. Yes. Okay. okay. <laughs> I can't hear you, but I'm going to keep going. Um, I just have a, I think one more slide to show and then I'll be happy to take any questions. So we were finishing our woodpeckers and then we'll move on. So these are some of the perching birds that you'll see in the winter. Um, these are good birds to think about seeing at your feeders. Um, the white-breasted nuthatch down here, the chickadee, um, the junco, this guy in the bottom left, um, he's, he's one that usually when I see him about now is when I know winter is coming. So I just started seeing them this week. Um, but these are all some of the perching birds that you will see in the winter. And some look a little bit different um, in the winter than in the summer. So for instance, this bird here in the center bottom, that's a goldfinch. And when we see them in the summertime, their, their feathers are bright yellow, right? The males, and they're, they just really stand out. Um, but in the fall, they're still here. In the winter, they're still here. Um, but we don't really notice them as much because their colors are a lot more muted. So that's the end of the presentation about the Habitat Guide to Birding. Um, for the Lake County Forest Preserves, we do offer other virtual programs. And here's just a list of some of the other ones that are coming up for us. Um, we have something about nighttime fly.